geeks. We'll have Threadripper, the second coming, GeForce and Quadro RTX Turing, oh my, the bodaciously beautiful Galaxy Note 9, OnePlus 6 and Moto Z 3s for thee, and much, much more next. Welcome on back to another edition of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. I'm not sure if we're live yet. I'm still seeing the splash screen on the main st on the stream, but hopefully we're live. Anyways, we're live. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> it's a little it's a little after the fact. Catch up, damn it, you interwebs. How you guys doing? It's it's been a busy couple of weeks. We had to take the week off because we were traveling and uh, running all over the countryside. Marco, you were on for some vacation. I was in New York, running around that crazy city. How was how was vacation? Vacation was good. Got to spend a week in Bermuda with my kids and my wife, literally doing nothing. We jumped in the pool every day. We walked to the beach. We just hung out, ate and relaxed for a week i really needed it and, you know if you were watching the site you probably wouldn't have known i was on vacation because three articles went up while i was gone that i wrote but what are you gonna do that's how it goes oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was like, that was right <laughs> just trying to make everybody else's job easy while i'm gone that's oh, all. You're such a team guy too <laughs> No, it's good while you're soaking up. Uh, that's the way you do it, man. You know, you soak up the Bermuda sunshine. You, uh, you, uh, you got all the, uh, the, 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 the hay baled or whatever. You made hay and then you went on vacation. That's beautiful. That's Chris, it. I mean, there, there was some craziness, um, as everybody who was watching the site saw go live on Monday that had to get done. But um, it, that was worth the effort because that was some fun stuff. Yeah, man. Yeah. Chris, are you making hay up in uh, Maine? I'll, hey. I'm getting there, trying to look on the uh, bright side, keep it busy. <laughs> You've got barley and hops. You're drinking. What are you drinking there, kid? It's the uh, Lone Pine beers. Bright Side IPA, which is uh, very, very citrusy. Lone a lot, Pine, a lot yes. less bitter to it. So, yeah, maybe not my favorite, but it's pretty good. Very is it first. a session? Is, is it a session as well, or in classic New England style? Uh, no, this is like seven point nine percent or something. Oh, seven point one. And not, it's a big boy, bad. Chris. Yeah. Don't don't get silly in front of the viewers now. Too mm -hmm. late. No, no, yeah. <laughs> no, no lampshades on your head or nothing. Hey, so I'm having uh another I'm I'm Lord of the Hobos yet again. Lord Hobo, this is a great sound in beer. Glorious Galaxy Pale Ale. Glorious Galaxy Pale Ale. These guys aren't even paying us, but this is not sponsored, by the way. But this is good but stuff. We and should I love get it. in that game. You know, right? Can we get a beer sponsor? Want to send us beer, just just to flash? Yeah, that'd be. I'd I'd do that. That's just leave a comment below. Get in touch. We like beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to the headlines because we're here to talk tech, not suds. Or we could talk a little of both, I guess. Uh, as beer Marco tech would be fascinating to talk about. Can we? Yeah. So, like, maybe like um, uh, thermoelectric beer chillers and stuff like that. Something. Something like that. All right. Well, let's let's move on to um, something that does anything but chill beers, and and that is uh, <laughs> that is AMD's thirty-two core second gen Ryzen Threadripper. Marco unboxed it, and then he benchmarked the snot out of it. And oh my gosh, what'd you think? This thing is it's it. it correct me if I'm wrong. And this is what struck me as something that was underreported on this is the world's is this not the world's first 32 core desktop processor qualify yes, those it, it, it absolutely yeah. is yeah 32 core yeah. workstation processor but yes it, it is designed for desktop systems this is not a server chip it's not epic it is an insane 32 core 64 thread desktop processor yes it is but Wow. I also had the opportunity to test the 2950X, which is the successor to last year's 1950X, the 16 core chip. And I sort of have to talk about these, although they're both second gen thread rippers, I sort of have to break these into two separate little discussions because they behave very differently. So the thread ripper 2950X, like last year's 1950X, is a 16 core 32 thread chip. It is basically powered by two eight core 
second gen Zen Plus dies. All right. So that chip has a, a base frequency of 3.5 gigahertz, a boost frequency of 4.4 gigahertz, and um, basically all of the same other specs from last year's chip because the die is fundamentally unchanged. It's just built on a new process, has a new boost algorithm, some power tweaks. So, you know, there's 9.6 billion transistors active yeah. in the 20, you know, 9.6 billion, nothing crazy <laughs> in the, uh, in the 16 core chip um, priced at 899. But the 2950 X is in my opinion, an awesome chip. First it's debuting a hundred dollars less than last year's 1950. Um, it's faster across the board faster single thread faster multi-thread better boost so the the new um the new boost algorithm in zen plus whereas last year's you sort of had a single core boost and an all core boost so you know you can boost to here or you can boost to here boost the to there chips yeah the new chips are all opportunistic so as long as you have power and thermal headroom it'll boost as many cores as it can for as long as it can and that translates to better performance across the board now in testing it beat the 1950x in every single test it actually hangs with intel's 18 core the flagship uh 79 7980xe the core i9 7980xe but it's literally half the price of the 7980. so in the test that it loses it's right there in the test that test that it wins that's great because it does so at really a fraction of the cost it's not cheap at 900 bucks but it's a fraction of the cost and with only those two die, this is sort of the important thing to consider between the two. With hmm. those two die in that chip, both die have memory attached, which brings us to the 2990WX. This is the insane 32 core, 64 thread chip, base clock of only three gigahertz, so 500 megahertz lower, <laughs> boost of only 4.2, so 200 megahertz lower there. But with you know a mass double the number of cores, so it's just tons of compute. But the way it's configured, you have two dies with memory attached, then you have two dies that don't have memory attached, and then the connections between the dies, the infinity fabric that connects everything, because you have twice as many dies, that bandwidth is cut in half. So this is an eighteen hundred dollar chip designed mm. for content creation professionals. You really need to be running something that's going to use all these cores to truly appreciate it. But if you are running something that will whack all of those cores, the 2990WX is, is freaking insane. I'm just going to jump to um, some of the crazy content creation tests. So like in Cinebench, for example, stock out of box without doing anything. 5164 in the multi-threaded test. That is 54% higher than Intel's fastest Core i9 7980XE. Just insane. And in Pavre, just missed hitting the 10,000 pixels per second. 9984 um, pixels per second in, in Pavre. That's 50% faster than the 7980XE. Just an insane chip. But if you look across all of our tests, there are instances where workloads will spill over to those die that don't have memory attached. And because mm. data basically has to be shuttled from one die to the other out to system memory back, back, you know, through the chip, it has much higher latency and workloads that aren't whacking all those cores. They're not really, you know, compute bottlenecked that are affected by that increased latency. It's sometimes lower. The performance is sometimes lower than much, much cheaper chips. Right now, I have more to talk about because what Intel mm. kind of, I'm not Intel, what AMD offers though, in the latest edition of Ryzen Master, you could do this with last year's chips too, but you didn't really have to do it as often. Now, that memory configuration on stock memory configuration with all cores enabled is a NUMA memory configuration, non unified memory architecture, right? Like some of the older server chips. But if in Ryzen Master you disable half the cores, which basically shuts off those two dies that don't have memory attached, the chip behaves much like any other Threadripper. <clears throat> Latency is reduced across the board. You still have 16 access to 16 cores, 32 threads, but those latency penalties go away. So let's say you're a psycho and you want a $2,000 uh, 32 core chip for a gaming rig. And um, you are a psycho. I am. We know that. Yes. <laughs> um, you could, if you didn't want to sacrifice a lot of, like you, you would look in, in our gaming tests with all cores enabled, it's really the slowest chip in the stack, but shut half of the cores off. And then it's right there in the mix at the top. 
So you'd have to disable half the cores, reboot the rig, boom, it behaves like a regular Threadripper. But when you want all that compute, you got to turn everything back on and reboot again. Hmm. Cool? Cool. Did I, did, did I ramble too much there? No, no, <laughs> no, you didn't. I, it, it's a complex chip. There's a, there's a lot of nuance in this chip. There's a lot of nuance in their architecture. And I think that's what's, that's what's fascinating about, about AMD's architecture in general, the way they architected Zen, the modularity of it, the scalability of it. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it cuts at the problem differently than the way Intel does it, where Intel integrates more cores on a monolithic die, you know, and, and keeps the interconnect as minimal as possible between um, CPU complexes. Here now you've got Infinity Fabric linking things up. A AMD's always had a strength in, in serial connectivity. And so now chaining cores together on a multi-chip module like this, getting to a core count in a socket that has never been done before, you know, or in a, I should say, in a, on a platform that's never been done before. So you really have to hand it to AMD, um, but it is a different kind of beast, um, but no doubt, you know, same, you know, footprint or whatever, standard motherboard footprint, the horsepower this thing puts out smokes the best thing that Intel has right now, which I don't think we'd, we, you know, if you asked us, you know, five years ago, if this day would ever come, we would have laughed at you, right, <laughs> Marco? I mean, most people probably would have. And, you know, you bring up a point yeah. that I forgot to mention. The reason for that this memory configuration on the, on the 2990WX is because AMD wanted to maintain platform compatibility with the X399. All of those motherboards are designed for quad-channel yeah. memory, not eight-channel memory. So half of those dice can't have memory attached. You know, the Epic quad-core processors are eight-channel. You know, you'd have memory attached to every die. So they don't kind of have these issues with latency bouncing between compute dies and dies that have memory attached. Um, there is some other cool stuff to talk about, though, um, that sort of caters to enthusiasts. Now, if you guys remember overclocking Ryzen chips, it used to be you set a multiplier, all of the advanced stuff enabled by Sense MI, you know, the precision boost and uh, all that stuff would go away and you're sort of locked at, you know, a base and boost frequency for all cores, which may not have been higher than the previous max boost frequency for single core because of, you know, power limitations. So mm -hmm. what AMD did with this latest version of Ryzen Master is incorporated, first they incorporated a few new features. There's like a new topology view. So you can actually see um, which cores are in which die in the processor. Um, you have the ability to do half cores or quarter cores to switch on and off, which then enables, you know, either unified memory, you can have NUMA or UMA um, with mm -hmm. the 2990WX if you disable cores. But the really cool new feature is called preci Precision Boost Overdrive. So what this does now, if you enable PBO, you don't give up any of the advanced features of Sense MI, the processor still boosts up to its max XFR frequency. But what it'll do is it'll read the max power capabilities of the motherboard. The motherboard manufacturers have to put some data in the BIOS that says this motherboard can supply this much power on, you know, on this rail, this rail, this rail. And you can now take advantage of all that power and the chip will boost much longer, higher for as long as it can that you know, you're, you're not hitting some sort of thermal or power threshold limit in there. And literally just by enabling PBO, which is essentially intelligently overclocking the chip, you can get huge performance boosts. Now, when I was being briefed on Threadripper, I personally witnessed a 2990WX. Literally, they, it was being air-cooled by the Wraith Ripper, which is that new sick air cooler. I have that covered in the article as well. It was being air-cooled by Wraith Ripper. They just flipped on PBO. Boom, over 6,000 in Cinebench, basically like record territory for... <laughs> with with no work literally just hit a switch and boom over 6000 which is just an insane score i hit 5944 and pbo works for all the thread rippers now so it's a really really cool help, feature help us one more time the acronym sure. pbo pbo Pre precision, precision boost, boost overdrive precision overdrive. Boost overdrive thank you <laughs> now you do have insane power increases though so just to give a quick <laughs> example stock the 2950 under load the test system pulled 266 watts with precision boost overdrive enabled that jumped up to 355 watts the 2990 wx stock with cpu under 100 percent load 
the system pulled 390 watts. And with PBO enabled, and, and I have to qualify, I had to turn down the power a little bit because if I maxed everything out, my system wasn't stable. So with the power turned down a touch, it almost jumped 200 watts, 574 watts um, from the test system. That's a huge amount of power. So you have to make sure you have a beefy PSU, a good motherboard that's being cooled well. You got to make sure that VRM is getting cooling and you need a good cooler on that chip to, to kind of take care of all that heat and power. What is the what is the VRM state like under under load with? Let, I'm not even just say standard operation, not overclocked, uh, just running you know full load. Uh, are the it, you know is it a is it a civil beast or are we talking something that's really just you know flat out sweating? You know, stock it's 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 a civil beast. All of the X399 boards. There's only a handful. They're all really high end boards. They all have beefy cooling. They're not all created equal. There is different power limits on different boards, which is why PBO has to read what's available. The motherboard makers have to put the data in the BIOS. But stock, it's okay. So the, the 2950 is a 180-watt chip. The 2990 WX is a 250-watt chip stock. And these boards, just to give you an example, the Gigabyte board that I use for testing, um, I forget which category it was in, but like stock, if you're not overclocking or enabling PBO, one power limit is set to like 300. When you enable PBO, the threshold went up to 700. So like there was more than you know 100% headroom available in, in some of the power the areas. So mm. stock, it, it's 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 a lot because there's so much silicon on, on in so many cores there. But if you're overclocking, it's like the Wild West. You got to make sure you have cooling. Like Asus, in the unboxing video, I show the extreme cooling kit Asus came out with. The ROG Extreme board, you know, one of the best X399 boards, they came out with a cooling kit that adds a, another heat sink. And like you literally clip an active fan onto the top heat sink that's on their stock. So you really got to make sure the boards are getting cooled properly. I remember those good old days, the active fans on the uh, on the VRM modules. Um, yeah, exactly. What's your, I'm going to put you on the spot. What's your favorite yeah. X399 motherboard right now? I, I can't say with <laughs> certainty because I've I've only spent a lot of time with like three of the boards. And yep. the board that I think I'm going to like the best is the one I didn't get to spend enough time with. So I really like the, the Gigabyte board that I've used from the beginning because it's it's been rock solid since I set it up. Um, that's the Gigabyte X399 Gaming 7 Pro, I believe. The the Asus uh, the Asus board, they're basically always good. The Asus board's been rock solid as well. But I also, I show this board because it's one of the newer boards that's kind of coming out uh, alongside these new Threadrippers, the MSI Meg X399 Creation. Yeah. So this was the board that basically every demo AMD did with these new chips because it's got a 19-phase power solution. And... Basically, the whole front of the board is a giant heatsink, right? So, and it's got two eight-pin CPU power feeds. So, because most of the overclocking or uh, tweaking is kind of power limited on this platform, that was where they focused power and cooling. And it's, I'm gonna hazard a guess that if I start messing with it, I'm gonna really like that board. I just haven't spent enough time to give a clear answer. So, AMD had that board, the MSI board, out front and center test them with yeah. It. yeah and i, I have vehicle. one i just you know i couldn't retest everything in time on the other board I, I wanted to i had already redone my test rigs recently and to retest every amd chip on that new board i, I would have ran out of time so i didn't get a chance to spend enough time on the msi board who needs a life you don't need a life <laughs> <laughs> you know if it was up to me I would do that stuff all day, every single day. That's my favorite thing. But yeah, you're, you're right. You got these kids and wife. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> we need family. Hey, Chris, yeah. we, we we haven't been we haven't pulled you in on this conversation yet. Yeah. What do you think of the of the second gen thread rip us? What, when, when is it? When is it coming my way? So you, I you will. Need, I'll box I, mine I up it. and send it over. I don't know when when pigs fly. Maybe. Around that time frame, <laughs> I need a new heating system I heard the for pigs my house. Flying. <laughs> I heard the pigs are flying lately. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you? Uh, so, so Chris, could you could you make use of uh, thirty two cores, sixty four threads of thread ripper deliciousness? Uh, I I think I could be troubled to find something to throw at it between 
rendering and gaming and streaming and everything else. I'm sure yeah, there's something yeah. there. Get some virtual machines running. Yeah. Get it out with a few terabytes of RAM. A few Oof. terabytes of RAM. Of course. Yeah. Hey, uh, what what do we think? What do we think Intel's answer to this is going to be and and when? Marco, um, wanna film that one? This Specifically for this, I, I don't have a clear answer. We all saw the Computex debacle with the 28 core that they said was running at five gigahertz. I think yeah. short term, some of those many core die that are in Xeons right now, you know, Intel has Skylake X die up to 28 cores. I think the best of the best of those cores are going to find their way to the desktop and the boost algorithms are going to be tweaked to sort of get as much out of those as they can. I don't think um, you're going to see those five gigahertz numbers out of a stock chip, but you will see a many core Intel chip in the, the shorter term. The rumors out there are, um, you know, ninth gen true eight core desktop chips are coming with really high clocks. Those are going to be nice. Those, see, those are going to be nice because if Intel is hitting the clocks that the rumors suggest, yeah. I think the eight core chips in some tests are going to hang with maybe the twelve core. The you know the Threadripper set are coming later. It, it's I think there's going to be a lot of action in the next few months, which is awesome because last year I sort of started the article off saying AMD kicked off a revolution, you know, in the desktop CPU space, and I know that sounds sort of over the top, but they really did. The difference in one year from what an enthusiast could have bought a year ago for a thousand bucks and what an enthusiast can buy today for a thousand bucks, it's like it's insane the difference. You're, you're talking, you know, double, quadruple the cores that people yeah. were used to. And it may be not always quadruple the cores, but quadruple the performance versus some of the older eight core chips. You know, it's right. it really changed the game and it caused Intel to sort of shift tactics. And um, I think now that Kazanich is out at Intel, maybe they're going to focus more on the enthusiast space again. We'll see. I'm all I'm speculating. I really have no nothing I can say definitively. But, yeah, you, you don't count Intel out. That's a company that has a ton of crazy tech. And if they want to go after a market, they will go after it hard. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, you don't you don't count Intel out. They, they have a lot of crazy tech. They have a manufacturing beast of a machine behind them as well. Uh, it used to be that you couldn't beat Intel because they would just throw fab and process at it. And there's just no way to compete with that level of um, inertia. In, in, in manufacturing with, with semiconductors, AMD found a way and they did so in a very um, ingenious way, which, you know, this, this modularity of, of Zen and, and the scalability of it. <clears throat> and, you know, kudos to them. They have officially poked the bear, so to speak. And it's like, man, you know, you, you didn't think that you didn't, you didn't think that come a day when, you know, architecturally, they can hang toe to toe again with Intel because the, the, they were so distanced for like the last 10 years. And now, bang, I mean, they are their stocks going gangbusters. Um, you know, they're really uh, they're really sort of back on the limelight. And there's a lot of positive inertia behind them. I hope Intel steps up and um, gives us something to cheer about as well, because, you know, that that competition is good. Um and and you know let's face it their 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 core architecture although it's different and and not currently as scalable as perhaps amd's is also extremely potent so you know what a great time to to be in computing if uh, if this is what you're into there's uh lots of toys to play with right chris chris you play yes. with toys what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> always always <clears throat> so yeah, yeah i mean it, it will be interesting to see what Intel does with the high core count chips. The 28 core sounds fascinating. If they can hit five gigahertz or not, yeah. you know, when you're dealing with 28 cores, does it really matter that much? Would it be better to see something clocked down in the four range with even more cores for the kind of market they're going after there? Probably could make more sense. Yeah, you know, I don't think Intel needs to do... Honestly, I don't think they need to match AMD core for core. I think, you know, with, with some of the performance advantages they have on a per core basis, I think if, if they optimize their current architecture and can get 
pricing in line. Um, I think mm -hmm. pricing for them is more of an issue, right? I mean, when you think about this, this 32 core thread ripper market, was it seven, 1800 bucks, right? Yes. Something like that. 1799. What's, what's, what's the, what's the nearest? XE? <clears throat> yeah. Is that, how much is that? Is that like uh, 7980 XE is two grand, two yeah. grand. That's two, for yeah, it's more expensive for 10 cores. No, 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 no right? for 18, 18 cores. cores. 18 cores, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking the Skylake X back from that. Anyways, cool. It's, uh, yeah. Like four, it's like 14 cores shy. Yeah. Yep. That's a big delta. Big delta. Anyways, fun stuff. Always interesting. Let's move on to something a little bit more, um, a little bit more mobile. Um, I actually checked out uh, Samsung's Galaxy Note 9 fresh live in New York this week, or last week, I should say, now in the lab with it this week. Um, the Galaxy Note 9, it is the um, the ninth coming of, of the Note, as you might imagine from the name, but it is really um, representative of a lot of refinement from the folks at Samsung and an impressive device. 6.4 inch OLED display, super AMOLED display. Samsung has that absolutely nailed. Um, easily the best smartphone display on the market now, especially in a large format. Um, DisplayMate came out and, and said, uh, this by the way is the best display we've seen in a handset uh, very recently, DisplayMate, the, uh, the display uh, qualification and, and testing company. And so um, impressive device, lots of, um, Horsepower on board, Snapdragon 845, 6 to 8 gig of RAM. It's nice that they offered the 8 gig of RAM variant. Um, 128 or 512 gigs of storage, 128 gigs or, or 512 gigs of storage. Half a terabyte of storage in a smartphone. Drop in uh, an SD card and you can have a full terabyte, um, a micro SD card. And now they've done some interesting things with the pen. So I'm going to actually pull this out here. This is the Galaxy Note 9 right here. And this is the new S Pen, which I'm sure the camera isn't doing it justice. But what's cool about this is it's now Bluetooth, Bluetooth BLE or low, low energy enabled. And it has a super capacitor on board. So you, you drop that sucker in the slot and within 40 seconds, it's fully charged and it's Bluetooth. So it's not just, you know, uh, touch on the screen, it's actually a remote control. So there's a little button on the side, and now you can do things like activate apps or um, simple act actuations within apps. So fire up the camera uh, with a touch of the button here, or I think a, a long hold of the button fires up the camera. And then, hey, you want to snap a selfie instead of putting on the timer, right, on the phone. Now you can just hold the camera up, and then snap your, you know, this this pen becomes a shutter button, essentially a remote shutter. And you can do that, you know, uh, whether it be selfie or, you know, any camera shot. Uh, it's it's actually a pretty cool addition. And the Note 9 now very refined, um, again, with that super polished, very thin. It's not going to do it justice here on screen again. But this is, this is the uh, ocean blue variant. Super, super polished. Aluminum and glass uh, setup, very premium device. Um, a little tall, I will say that. It's definitely still, you know, a big device, 6.4 inch display. So it's a it's a little on the tall side for some folks, I'm sure. Samsung was smart. They uh, they moved the fingerprint sensor to the middle here, just underneath the camera array, and the camera array is essentially what you will find on the Galaxy S9 Plus. So now you have dual <clears throat> rear cameras, 12, meg 12 megapixel rear cameras, dual. Uh, one is a standard um, uh, aspect camera with dual aperture. So I think it's F1.5 and F2.4 aperture, and it will alternate between either depending on the light situation. The other one's a wide angle shooter, and that's a fixed uh, F2.4 aperture. Both have optical image stabilization and the live focus uh, or portrait mode shooting as, as you might commonly refer to it with nice depth of field bokeh effect is impressive. So far from my, from my opinion, comparing it to the Pixel 2 XL, better at portrait mode shooting. This is a great phone. I'm still stepping through the review. 
still crunching the numbers on it right now. Performs really well. I've got the six gig version. Wish I had the eight gig RAM version because uh, I think there's a little bit of more performance to have from the Snapdragon 845 and, and certain applications. Um, but nine hundred dollars. Oh, excuse me, nine hundred ninety nine dollars. A thousand bucks for the six gig RAM, one twenty eight gig storage version. Twelve forty nine for the um, eight gig of RAM, five hundred twelve gig storage version. Pricey. You got to be an Android power user for sure to justify the cost of this. That's unlocked, of course, and off contract. Um, but an impressive phone and a worthy Note successor so far, from what I can tell. What do you guys think of this thing, the Galaxy Note Nine? I feel like <laughs> every every year the Note comes out, I just I first think, oh man, I want that phone because they always have such incredible tech behind them. It's a big phone, which I love. Um, fantastic cameras and all that. But then yeah. I start looking back at that, the interface and the pricing. And, you know, I'm, I'm a stock Android purist. I think Google gets it right. No reason to mess with it. So, you know, when I see the, the well, I, I guess they're not calling it TouchWiz now anymore, are they? What's what's the no. new name for the Samsung uh, interface? Yeah, it's it's like Samsung. Um, oh, I gotta look it up. It's like Samsung Experience or something like that. I have to look it up. It's not TouchWiz anymore. It hasn't been for a while. But yeah, there's oh, there's this. I guess I, yeah, yeah. yeah there's this um, and it, right. it just it doesn't gel with me. Um, so you know, as much as I I could see myself using the S Pen for quick note taking and everything else. You know that kind of interface just doesn't jive with me and then when you get to the thousand plus pricing uh that's a lot to ask for a phone as yeah as incredible as it is yeah yeah you know it's it's got everything like one of the things that occurs to, to me with this phone is it really does have everything imaginable that you could you know, the, the, the latest technology uh, available in smartphones, 4,000 milliamp hour battery. So far from what I've seen, this thing is a battery juggernaut. It's it's really good battery life wise, has wireless charging, has this pen with with now with Bluetooth, uh, uh, low energy for additional functionality beyond just, act, you know, pen stylus input. Now you've got remote control functionality with it has this feature called Dex, where you can hook it up to a display. Literally, they have an HDMI dongle now. You can buy a Dex dock, which will give you keyboard and mouse, you know, plug in USB as well as HDMI output to a big display. But now they have this simple dongle that you just plug in USB-C to HDMI, bang, and, and the phone turns into a touchpad. And now you have a full desktop experience and it, and it shows in, in our preview demo uh, one of the Samsung reps actually stepping through Dex, and he's just advancing PowerPoint slides, you know, um, with with the pen as a remote control. So you know, it's like, especially if you're in the enterprise model, you know, or or maybe even you know, school system that kind of thing, where having a little bit of that, you know, sort of cross platform uh, mm -hmm. functionality, it's really an impressive device. But it is it is pricey. But yeah, it's like. Okay, what do you want in a smartphone? Everything about the kitchen sink, we're just going to throw it in there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what they did. That's what they did. Marco, what do you think? I know you like I know you like them big. You like them big smartphones. You like little laptops and big smartphones. Right? Yeah, so I, I I'm a Note 8 user. It it actually I, I'm I like the Note 9 uh in everything that Samsung announced is nice, but it's really such an incremental upgrade from the 8. I don't know how many people are going to jump on. I mean, the, the Note 8 is basically has the same platform inside. Um, doesn't have quite as robust cooling, apparently. Um, and I think the battery is slightly smaller, but it's the same Snapdragon 845. Like, I, I usually Samsung pushes the envelope there. I guess because of the timing here with with Qualcomm, they instead they you know beefed up the cooling, which does help performance you know across the board. But I'm not quite as excited as the S Pen's new X Pen features. And there's not and the camera stuff. Maybe the camera's a little better, but is it enough to make me upgrade? Probably not. Now it's ultimately. It will probably be the nicest Android super phone or, or large format phone uh, when it finally hits store shelves. But it's just not that the note is usually, you know, for a time, just the leader across the board. And they didn't weren't able to pull that off this time. I don't think it's Samsung's fault, but it is what it is. 
So, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how I feel overall. That's an interesting observation, actually. And, and um, you make a good point. Um, yes, if you are a Note 8 user, you probably don't have enough to upgrade for unless, number one, you want those additional pen features. Um, I'm not sure what the Note 8's camera setup was like back in the day, but this is the Galaxy S9 Plus camera uh, array, basically, and it's seriously top-notch. It's really good. It can, it's probably you know, one of the few phones in the market that competes with Google's Pixel 2 XL, and frankly, I, sometimes I can go either way on Pixel 2 XL. I, I'm not so fond of the way it renders, but that's personal preference. Sometimes it looks great. Sometimes I think it looks a little drab. Anyways, yeah, it's 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 um, it's an incremental refinement, but that's what strikes me about this phone. If you're if you're not a Note user, or you maybe were an, uh, you know a, a generation behind the Note 8, this phone is so refined now. That's what I'm getting out of it. Is it's it's so refined. It's got everything thrown in there, and it is all integrated very well. So there's I've I've got that sort of feeling with it right now as I'm stepping through the review there's like everything's done exceptionally well that that Snapdragon 845 you mentioned we have an interesting article and you should check on the site um, a uh, benchmark bake-off I called it uh, one plus six which is a fantastic phone by the way um, review coming up on that I'm gonna make that thing my daily driver I'll be honest I'm not a I'm not a big super big phone guy so the note nine's a little too big for me um, but we did a benchmark bake-off between the one plus six john i don't know if you can bring that up uh the one plus six and the galaxy note 9 and one of the claims that the samsung folks made with the note 9 was that the in, the cooling has been improved so there's a 3x larger heat spreader and it's got something that they called carbon water cooling which sounded to me like a little bit of marketing speak but frankly there's some sort of carbon and i'm sure it's a vapor chamber but it's probably a carbon fiber based vapor chamber type thing is, is what I think they're referring to, but they call it carbon water cooling and a three X heat spreader. And, and we put it through the benchmarks and we, what we did was we ran multiple, con, you know, consecutive runs of very uh, graphically intensive benchmarks to just push the thermal envelope on the, on these phones as much as possible. What we realized was, and I saw this not just with the one plus six, which had, eight gigs of RAM and a Snapdragon 845, the model I have, versus the Note 9, which has six gigs of RAM and 845. What we realized was the, the OnePlus 6 bled off anywhere from 5 to 10% of its performance over time. The Note 9 bled off almost nil. And that was, you know, after extended use, now you're running things like um, 3D Mark or uh, what was the other one? GFX Bench, I think we ran. Oh, no, it was Antutu. Uh, and 3D Mark, 3D Mark really, I mean, the phones get hot when you run them, you know, four, five, six times in a row consecutively without letting them rest. They, they get warm in your hand. The, the, the Note 9 didn't, I mean, I, I don't even think it was 2%. The, the OnePlus 6, which is a great phone and performs like a dream, um, bled off anywhere from 5 to 10%. So legitimately, Samsung has some special mojo going on in there with this cooling certainly they've got the other thing you, know, you got to remember is they got a big phone here it's a 6.4 inch display one plus six is a good comparison 6.28 inch display that's uh, right here the one plus six and um uh really like this phone gonna be reviewing that next fantastic device um so it was a good comparo and it looks like you know they did a really good job samsung did at architecting the internal um you know, platform for this thing such that it operates really well under pressure, maintains its performance, great battery life, fantastic display. Yeah, it's a Snapdragon 845. I don't know what else is available right now. So what are you going to do? But yeah, it's it's definitely a, a refinement and not a revolutionary uh, advancement in the note. So in so many words. <laughs> <laughs> Is, I mean, is that fair or is, am I over? I'm, I'm probably, uh, I'm, I, you know, no, I like tend the to one get... thing I'll say with the Note 8, um, I, I've used it for a while now and it's basically been perfect. You know, Samsung has taken a lot of heat for, you know, 
<laughs> it used to be called TouchWiz. Now it's the Samsung Experience 9.5 in that phone. You know, they took a lot of heat for the software tweaks they make to Android, but the Note 8 has been basically flawless for me. And the battery life in the Note 8 is good. The cam everything's good about it. There's, there's nothing I dislike about the Note 8, except maybe with the case, uh, it's it's a little bulky and heavy, but I, I don't mind because it's so big and nice and it just works well. If the Note 9 is, although it's got the same platform, ultimately it will probably be better across the board because of the better cooling because it's just an updated screen updated software tweaks without having to reinvent the wheel because it's the same platform if it's better across the board it's going to be a fantastic device but yeah just there's only so much they yeah. can do with the same platform yeah we 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 certainly you know we 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 have all the numbers done and the review isn't live yet but um you know way better battery life than the note 8 uh, better performance than the note 8 as well um, I, I, I wonder though, question for you before we move on from this, what did you think about, what do you think about touch? It's not touch was anymore, but the Samsung skin over the, over, uh, over Android. Are you, are you Android seven on that at this point or did they upgrade you to eight one yet to, to Oreo? Um, my, mine is not, uh, eight, eight one yet. It, I don't yeah. mind it. Um, it's, it's yeah. clean enough. And you know, if everyone remembers, I, I came from windows phone. So, you know, I didn't have a lot so of experience. But, no, yeah, I, I like to do dumb stuff for a long time. But, um, yeah, I, I, haven't pl I didn't play with a Pixel or any of the pure Android devices long term. So my frame of reference was different. And I don't mind the Note 8 at all. It's, it's, I really like the phone. It's, it's treated yeah. me fantastically well. So, yeah, yeah. I, I prefer something not get messed with. Um, but... It's it's a great phone, a great device. I really have no complaints. Yeah, you know, I got to be honest with you. One of the things I moved off the the S nine plus, the Galaxy S nine plus, is because there was a little bit too much involvement for me with Samsung's interface. Things like text to speech. When I was doing, um, you know, I, I do a lot of voice texting. You know, I'm I'm one of the older generation guys that. You know, I, I don't hunt and peck as as quick on the uh, on the little keyboards, so I talk to the phone. And it seemed like no matter what I did, whether I choose chose Google Voice um, for for that input or Samsung's, uh, which I believe uses Bixby or some sort of engine that Samsung includes, I, it just wasn't uh, picking it up as accurately as other phones I've used. And the even the interface to it was in the way. There was like a you know a big button in the way, and I, it just seemed to be. A little bit more clunky. You haven't found that to be the case. You're you're satisfied in that respect. I very rarely do text to speech, so like that ah. particular scenario, no. Um, okay. Yeah, I haven't really. There's, there's no. There's nothing kind of funky with the interface for me, at least the way I use the phone. Cool, cool. Yeah, I know what I like about. I will say this, and shifting gears, and then we'll we'll move on. What I like about the One Plus Six. This these guys have what's what they call the Oxygen OS. It's basically Android 8.1 Oreo. Um, super thin um only the the littlest hooks here and there smart sort of thoughtful um feature ads without any skin it's like there's no skin there's just if you need to add a feature we we, we plug that in and make it look like an android it did so it like doesn't get in the way at all so it's it's a, it's an interesting device but yeah the note 9 we're stepping through that review right now. Um, that's going to go up in the next couple of days, and it is a fabulous note. It is it is definitely a um, revision, a um, evolution versus revolution. But I think Samsung has really, really refined it um, to the point where now, if if you haven't jumped on the note and you've been thinking about it, it's you know I hate to sound cliche, but I'm going to say it. It's the best note yet. I mean, it really is. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just, you know, the matter of fact. So um, that's that's it for uh, for smartphones, I think. Well, wait a minute. No, Chris, you're looking at smartphones too lately. You looked at the Moto Z3 Play, which you were hoping was going to be a, a battery beast, but it, it wasn't. It, it was different. Tell yeah, I think it. I think anyone who knows me knows that I have been a massive proponent of the Moto Z Play line since the first one because the battery would just go and go and yeah. go and just not die. And if it, if it if it threatened to get close, you throw a battery pack on it 
and then you've got another <laughs> day or two of battery life on it. Like, absurd. So coming into the Z3 Play, you know, you, you have those expectations for it where you want it to go and go and go, and you start to look at the spec list, and you see that they've improved the processor. It's up to a Snapdragon 636 versus the 626 and 625 in the previous two generations. Mm -hmm. So it's got a bit more power. It's onto a big little configuration where the 625 and 626 were all little cores, and Freckles has made her entrance. What's up, into Freckles? <laughs> yeah, she can hear me talking. Um, so now you've got those big cores in the mix, which are going to help keep it snappy, but they're also going to burn energy a bit more. Um, and then you look at the battery capacity, and it's the same 3,000 milliamp hours that we saw with the Z2 Play, which is already you know not as strong of a battery life performer as the as the original Moto Z Play. Um, so you kind of get get worried going into it. Um, so to take a side step from battery life for a bit, we'll, we'll go to performance and performance is noticeably better with the Z3 play. Um, it's still not going to be up at flagship levels. Of course, it's a 600 series Snapdragon. It's not like an 800 series, um, mm -hmm. but it is better. It is smoother. The big cores do make a difference when you're rendering pages and, and going through the, interface and such. It's still not going to game super smoothly like you would on a higher end, um, but it is better. Um, and then, you know, you look at things like the camera. It now has a dual camera set up with depth sensing so that you can do things like a really nice portrait mode with it. You can, uh, it is Google's AR core compatible. So you can do things like take measurements with it through the camera app. Um, mm -hmm. So there are some very cool tricks with it. But it, it just seems it's lost its identity because it doesn't have that battery life and the performance isn't there to really push it to that next level either. Like it's still a mid-range performing phone. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's enough, of course, to get you through all your work stuff through the day. But it doesn't have that battery life to take it to the next level. And on top of that, it is a little thicker than the Z2 Play as well by 0.8 millimeters, which... Seems like a little, but it you know if if you're if you've got them hand in hand, it is noticeable. So mm -hmm. if they're going to expand the space in it, you know you you'd like to see them put some battery capacity back in, especially since that's what the line is known for. So it is a little disappointing from that aspect. What they do do with this generation, because uh, the the first generation Z Play, they gave you a style plate for the back, so if you didn't have a mod on it, you at least had something there to fill in the space. The right. Z2 Play right. didn't ship with anything, so it was just the bare phone. You had to get your $20 style plate or whatever else if you wanted to fill in the gap. Um, I primarily use the Turbo Power mod, which makes it pretty thick, but gives you a ton of battery life. So that worked for me. With the Z3 Play, they give you this battery mod, and I don't have the phone in front of me because it's running another uh, battery life benchmark actually right now, so I don't want to disturb it. But they do give you a 2200 milliamp battery with it out of the pack, which is nice. It does bring the battery life back up. But I think even with this, it's still maybe as good as the original Z Play, just <clears> on its own. So, you know, you're, you're, you're getting good battery life, but it's, it's a compromise. You've got to be, you know, using the battery pack that is a little thicker than a style plate. Um, so mm. it, it's, I, I do like the phone. It, it performs well. It, it, you know, it's nice to use. It has some good features that are useful. The, the, the new the camera is better. Um, so the the Z and Z two plays took a lot of flack because their cameras were just okay, nothing special. This one I do feel like you can use pretty confidently. It still doesn't have optical image stabilization, so low light is going to be iffy. Um, <laughs> But in general daylight stuff, it's nice and sharp. It's quick. Um, you have some nice modes in it, like the cinemagraph mode, where you can basically record a GIF, GIF, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> and you select an area of the photo that you want to animate while the rest is still. So you can get, you know, if you have moving water or, uh, you know, something which is a little bit of motion, like a flag waving, you can isolate that motion to just that spot and then have a still photo for the rest of it for something that's a little more interesting to look at, maybe. Yeah, I saw that, um, yeah. 
then it's still photo. So that's a lot of fun. It, you know, it has the the portrait mode. It has a cutout mode. It has AR uh, rendering, so you can put face filters over yourself and and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a lot of fun things you can do with the camera. It's capable. Um, for a five hundred dollar phone, it's not bad. You know, it's interesting though. I mean, you're, you're talking about, are we sure about that battery life? I mean, I know it's hard. We can't test it. That's the problem is when you, when you snap on that, that mod, it starts mm -hmm. charging the phone. It goes, it, it charges the phone. So you really can't, you can't test it with traditional benchmarks because there's no rundown. It, it starts charging and then you lose track right. of where, you know what I mean? Where it started off, but you've got 3000 milliamp hours in the phone. And then another 2200 milliamp hour battery pack. Is that correct? Right. But the issue with that is this isn't going to be fully efficient because it's not powering the phone from this. It's charging the phone from this. Uh, so you do get right, some right, loss right. from the 2200 milliamp hours. And sure. plus that's not, you know, when they, when they have that measure of battery capacity, you don't really get the whole 2200 milliamp hour. Right. Anyways. So, you know, it, it probably performs more like, 1200 to 1500 milliamp hour batteries um in in <laughs> real life terms so yeah you you do get that but the other thing about that is when you have these these power mods on it disables android's power saving features because it's charging ah right so, so yeah you don't get the, those the and all that it's not as yeah, power yeah, yeah, efficient yeah. when these are connected and you can go into software you can turn it off in software even when it's connected and then you'll be fine um but if it's on and charging, then you know you are taking a little extra efficiency loss with that as well. So hmm. it's it's great to supplement, um, but it doesn't make the phone in and of itself. Besides that, if you if you then want to use a mod, say you want to take the Hasselblad camera mod out and do some shooting or run a projector or have your speaker mod on, yeah, you're not getting that extra battery life, right? So you gotta yeah. wait until you're finished with the mod, then put the battery pack back on. Um, I like having it just in the phone. If if they had released the Z3 Play with a 3,500 or even 4,000 milliamp hour battery life, I, I I I'd have no reservations with it. You know, I don't care mm -hmm. if it's thicker. Um, it's still not as thick as the original Moto Z Play, and I had no issues yeah. with how thick that was. Um, there's a yeah. lot of potential there. Then it gets murkier because, as we know, Moto just announced the Z3, right. which is basically the, on that. yeah, it's basically the same phone as the Z3 Play. So they've taken it. So the previous, the Z2, the Z2 Force, or whatever, had the 1440p displays, you know, and were all out flagships for all intents and purposes, especially the Force side. Um, the Z3 takes it back to a 1080p class display. So the same um, 2160 by 1800 display that's on the Z3 play, two by one ratio, um, and still four gigs of RAM, still a 3000 milliamp hour battery. The only difference is it has a Snapdragon um, 835 in it instead of these 636 that's in the Z3 play. Right. So you get more power with that, the battery life, 10 nanometers on the 630 on the sorry 10 nanometers on the 835 versus the 14 nanometers 636 it may even be more power efficient so it just creates a lot of confusion but we'll have to see when, once once uh, Brandon finishes taking his look at it yeah 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 we should uh, we should move along it's it's going to be an interesting thing i it seems like motorola's kind of lost a little bit of their identity right now and they're trying to find it and i hope they uh, get some mojo back because they have some impressive stuff over uh, over the years and certainly the the best implementation of a modular phone i think we've seen yet or the best approach to it which is not easy but let's let's move on and uh, close this thing off on a on a seriously high note we expect to uh, learn more in the days ahead. I am packing up and shipping off to Germany, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, as everybody knows, uh, NVIDIA has announced their GeForce gaming celebration in Germany. And we are fully expecting to learn of the next GeForce there. Already unveiled uh, this week at SIGGRAPH, uh, NVIDIA stepped up with the GeForce RTX Turing uh, GeForce, uh, excuse me, not GeForce, Quadro RTX <laughs> um, cards for uh, pro graphics. 
we expect GeForce RTX is coming with Turing uh, next uh, in, at the next show in at GamesCon in Germany. But yes, the uh, the Quadro RTX and and now um, teasing GeForce RTX um, RTX for ray tracing. Marco, why don't we kick it over to you? Let's talk about this thing. What can we expect from these folks at Nvidia? Is this th this thing from what we've seen on the Quadro side looks like? um an amazing sort of game changing technology real time real time ray tracing in games are we there yet um we're, we're there in terms of technical capability uh, the, the, the game developers yeah. are going to have to embrace all of nvidia software tools and you know make the games for this hardware so it's not going to happen overnight but we're talking some massive horsepower. 6X, the ray tracing performance of the fastest Pascal. We don't know how gaming's going to perform just yet, but in terms of CUDA core counts, the Quadro RTX 5000, the base model, has uh, 3,072 CUDA cores and 384 tensor cores. Um, and NVIDIA kind of coined a couple of new terms that, that can do six giga rays a second. Um, and it's got 16 gigs of really fast Samsung 14 gigabit per second GDDR6 memory. Now, the, six, the RTX 6000 and 8000 bumped that up to 4,608 CUDA cores, 576 tensor cores. We talk about those in our Volta architecture, so if you want to learn what those are for, um, mm. plus 24 gigs of GDDR6 memory. And NVIDIA is claiming 10 gig arrays a second. We're not sure what that means. I mean, it, it means it can do 10 ray traced ray 10 giga ray traced rays a second and 16 <laughs> teraflops so in terms of you know floating point performance they're way ahead of pass of current pascal chips they have these new capabilities with these new cores um there's also a new capability to do uh, integer and floating point operations in parallel so you know this is all stuff that software is going to have to be designed to take advantage of but Stepping back from the technical demo, I know we sort of reacted differently to the to the live webcast. I, I was literally slack jawed by the end. The what 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 Nvidia showed. So that first ray tracing demo that took four yeah. voltas that was shown a few months ago can now right. run on one of these RTX cards. Right, that's insane. Like if you think about that, and those are those are those are high end voltas. Um, right. you can now run on one. And that the final demo, I forgot what they called the demo, but it was like this robot dancing to music. It looked so good to me. I, I was literally watching it slack jawed. I, it, yeah. I'm sure that was running on a server with multiple uh, Quadro RTXs, but still, it, it was it was awesome. So yeah. there's just a lot to consider here, right? If I, I know the professional world, you know, you know, the movie creation things like that. Um, the visual effects field, I would bet the farm they're going to embrace this wholeheartedly. The gaming scene, it's it's going to be different because, you know, AMD is just, just not going to have this. And as cool as it is, game developers want to sell as many games as they can. So they're not going to release a game that only works a certain way on certain cards. It's not like right. the 3D effects glide days. So I, I think this is a real punch to the Radeon Technologies Group because in terms of, of technical prowess, it, it's really impressive to me. Um, but how it plays out over the next year, um, it's going to be really interesting. You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm impressed, and I hope it kicks much ass when it hits the consumer space. I want to test out the Quadros, too, because I think they're going to be super awesome. But I don't know. What an exciting time to be an enthusiast, man. Good stuff coming. <laughs> yeah, no, I was I was I was thoroughly impressed by the demo too. I was I was a little I was left a little flat. I think you mentioned that that we were a little bit mixed on it. Um I was thoroughly impressed. I wanted to see more like when that robot started dancing and and we were watching him fluidly move and the light re and reflections off of him. It was just so quick. I just wanted to see more. I wanted to see give me give me give me the full deal, man, but I'm sure it was like, you know, a serious render job to get that thing done but it is impressive i think you hit the nail on the head um there's there's two dynamics here that that are going to affect market adoption um and 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 that is the game developer community and having a common platform that you know supports ray tracing and and not just nvidia but it's for them to step out with this capability to show this sort of horsepower to show this this sort of next generation technology you know in in action it's it's 
you, you got to start somewhere. And you know, when it comes to gaming, you, you got to start somewhere. Real time ray tracing in gaming is a long term thing, a longer term thing. And they just drove a stake in the sand. They just said, here it is. We're starting now, and it's impressive. And when you look at the you look at the actual silicon area, Turing seven hundred and fifty four square millimeters versus Pascal, which was like four hundred and seventy and change. It's a big honking GPU, man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big boy. And you know what I think this really, as impressive as the demos were, what it really does is sort of lay the foundation for the next 10, yeah. 15 years of advancements. If you thought things were nuts from the, you know, the TNT and early GeForce days to now, I think mm. from now until ray tracing is really ubiquitous and just free in terms of performance, which is going to along mm. the, the visuals that we're going to see and what gamers get in the next few years is, is going to be off the charts. You you literally someday will not be able to distinguish game engine from um, special effects cinematics in the movie, right? Yes. That's where we're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Agreed. How cool is how cool is that? <laughs> it's awesome. And it's going to be all right. You're going to be able to play that. You're going to be able to you know play you know Avengers. And uh, you know, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. You're going to be able to, you know, be that character. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be, it's, it's, it, it, we are, we are headed there. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Chris, are you excited? Yeah, I mean, so you know, <laughs> even more than polygons, lighting just makes a scene. So if you have real time yeah. ray tracing in there, the light just becomes so much more vibrant, so much more real. And it just becomes that much more believable. And there's still room, you know, you're, you're talking about making photorealistic scenes. But even just if you if you have a game with an art style that can then have that ray trace lighting in there, you know, you can really make a unique visual impact with that. And I, I do think that once it's available across all platforms with some kind of standardization, it's it's going to take off like like nothing we've seen before. Yeah, lighting and reflections add a level of realism and immersion to a, a scene that um, you it, it, you just need it, need it correct, and you need it in abundance to to um, mimic real life. And so, yeah, the realism is great. I'm heading to Germany. I'm going to go report on that. So stick stay tuned to hothardware.com because we will be uh, bringing you the details uh, in person on uh, Nvidia's next generation GeForce RTX coming soon. Guys, parting words. We got to wrap this sucker up. We're going long now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll I'll let you do the close. And uh, you know, Chris is pointing out all of the details right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> swing on by the site at hothardware.com, twittercom hardware where you can interact with us. facebookcom hardware youtubecom vids or hot hardware. Subscribe. Hit the uh, reminder bell. Join us. We're here. Hopefully every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, Two and a Half Geeks, our webcast. Lots of video reviews coming to the YouTube channel as always as well. Galaxy Note 9 coming up for the review this week, I'm going to say. And, um, man, we'll be talking all things GeForce RTX very soon as soon as I get back from Cologne. Here I come, Cologne. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Take care. Hide your daughters, Cologne. <laughs> <laughs>